live stream is up and we are going live. Very good. As uh, people are streaming in, let me convene us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word of thanks to those who helped make today happen, in particular to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel. Thank you, and thank you all of you for joining us. Today is the second session of our biennial symposium on teaching public health, sp split across sessions over three weeks. We are in a moment which has redoubled the importance of how we teach public health, and in particular, how we teach public health in a manner that puts diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice at its core. COVID-19, its economic consequences, and the legitimate anger that has followed the killing again of people of color has shown the need for a public health that can support a healthier future once this pandemic has passed. Academic public health is core to creating this, helping to shape the rising generations of public health professionals, giving them the tools and the perspectives to create a healthier world. As we continue this conversation about how diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice can inform our teaching, this subject is more timely than ever. The moment we are living in has reminded us that the values we are here to discuss are not yet fully present in our society. Changing the structural racism that shapes so many institutions means changing the conversation to urge a focus on those values which create a healthier world and a healthier, fairer, and more just world for all. And changing the conversation starts with the next generation, which is what makes teaching public health in a manner informed by diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice so critical. I learned from last week's panel, and I very much look forward to such a conversation today, to learning from our panelists and from you, our community. Thank you again for joining us. I am now pleased to turn over the screen to the intellectual architect of this event, our Associate Dean of Education, Dean Lisa Sullivan, who will introduce our speakers. Lisa. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So as uh, Dean Galea said, this is our second Dean Symposia on teaching public health and the focus is on inclusive teaching. This is the second of three sessions. We originally had planned a day together on June 4th, but unfortunately the circumstances didn't allow us to get together in person. So we've separated the symposia into three sessions, being the second of three. So the first was held two years ago and it was around teaching public health. And it resulted in a book that you see here with contributions from educational leaders around the globe talking about innovations in public health teaching. Everything from active and collaborative learning, teaching cultural competency, teaching in diverse classrooms, active learning, practice-based teaching, teaching by the case method, and difficult conversations in the classroom. There are multiple chapters here with practical tips that can be useful for anyone new or experienced in teaching public health. The focus of this seminar this series um, is on diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice. And our goal with developing this symposia was to think about ways we can create good learning spaces for all students, provide each student equal access to learning, promote mutual respect, appreciate differences, combat implicit bias, engage in difficult conversations, welcome, support, and value all students as they learn. As Dean Galea said, we had an exciting panel last week with experts from around the country 
and they gave us lots of uh, valuable information. I've captured a few things in bullets here. Some of the topics that we talked about were ensuring meaningful learning, ensuring that all voices can be heard, considering who has access to learning. We talked that maybe our curricula are too narrow, thinking about what counts for credit, space for students to engage, group work and in particular invisible barriers, doing inside outside work as we approach this important topic and the hierarchies that exist in academia. For anyone who missed the first panel, we'll provide the link in the chat and you can see it as a video recording. So I want to turn it over now to our moderator for today's session, Professor Candice Belanoff. She is clinical assistant professor of community health sciences and a maternal and child health epidemiologist. She's particularly interested in the relationship between social forces and inequities and patterns of population health. She regularly teaches several courses at the School of Public Health, most notably a course that she developed on social justice and the health of populations, racism and other systems of oppression. It turns out that Candace is also the winner of our 2020 Norman Scotch Award for Excellence in Teaching. And I want to take a second just to recognize her here because unfortunately we couldn't recognize her at our commencement because we couldn't have a, a commencement with everybody together. So one of the students in her class remarked this course was well worth all of the tuition of an MPH at Boston University. Another said I've never crossed paths with a professor that possesses the combination of intellectual acuity, genuine care and pro proactive demeanor that Candace possesses and bestows onto her students. She makes strides to shatter all power divides that exist by creating an equitable world for all of her students that is free of prejudice. And she does this leading by example. I hope that gives you an idea of why she has been selected to moderate this important panel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Lisa, for turning me red, it'll actually help with the lighting in this room, which makes me otherwise look quite ghostly. Um, so thank you, Dean Sullivan, for the introduction. And thanks to both you and Dean Galea for hosting this series of critical conversations. I really, truly am honored um, and excited to moderate this discussion among a group of such eminent thought leaders in the area of equity and justice and teaching. Um, and I think we can all agree that the, un, the, the timeliness of this conversation is uncanny, except it's also woefully overdue. So um, without further ado, I would love to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Vijay Sathi. Dr. Sathi is a teaching associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience and um, is special projects assistant to the Dean of Undergrad Education at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a national expert in inclusive teaching and her research involves evaluating the impact of innovative teaching techniques as well as retention in STEM. Um, Dr. Sathi is the recipient of numerous teaching awards for excellence in undergraduate education and quite notably, the campus's student choice for best professor at UNC. That's really awesome, congratulations. Um, so Dr. Sathi, please take it away. Thank you and thank you all for spending some time with us. And, and I know it's not necessarily afternoon for, um, for some of you, but sometime wherever you are today to join us and have this um, hopefully meaningful discussion um, and certainly very timely. Um, so I wanted to talk with you a bit about inclusive teaching from the perspective of um, not necessarily the curriculum, because I think my, my colleagues on, on the panel will speak uh, more to curriculum components, but to think about the ways in which um, as educators, we could be thinking about the tools in our classroom, the course design and the way we facilitate um, as a means of promoting inclusive teaching. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, which has some slides. Okay, um, and are you able to see my slides? Great, thank you. Um, so you'll see here that I have spelled my name um, out in 
somewhat phonetic terms, Vigi. Um, it is um, often an unfamiliar name to people in the United States. So I like to at least provide um, some anchors around how that name is pronounced. And, um, and also I give my students um, as well as colleagues, I have a link to it in my email signature that says, how do I pronounce my name? Um, we know that saying people's names correctly is an important part of belonging and making sure that um, people feel valued. And so this is one way in which we can uh, model this for our students is to share the tools and tricks we have for being able to help our students see that um, it's, it's okay that, that people uh, might need some of these guidances around how to say names. Um, and in fact, I ask my students to just use their phone to record the audio pronunciation of their name and upload it to the learning management system. So this gives me the opportunity to practice in my own um, office, for example, without having to ask them numerous times about um, how to pronounce their name. Um, so as Candace mentioned, I am in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, and I also hold a role in the Office of Undergraduate Education. My background is in psychometrics, and so um, I do a lot of work around um, basically quantitative reasoning courses, as well as building dashboards for our campus, thinking about ways in which we can use um, data to um, improve student success. And um, I wanted to just, sometimes I run out of time at the end, I wanted to just invite you to join me on Twitter uh, to continue this conversation. Um, I love learning from everybody. And so please, uh, please stay in touch. So um, I wanted to also point out <clears throat> this tip that it's important to prompt our students to interact socially by introducing themselves and providing basic information about their gender identities and names. Um, and one very easy way we can do that is by modeling it. So you'll see, I've, I've shown you here on the slide, but you'll also see in my Zoom window, I've edited it so that it includes that pronunciation guide as well as my pronouns. Um, now, I don't I don't require students to do this, but I make it an invitation for them to do that. And so this is um, just another way and we can harness technology to be able to, um, to give people some um, abilities to share about themselves. So I'm gonna ask you this question now, what are possible reasons students may not speak up when we pose questions to a whole group? Okay, so did that feel like a really long time? <laughs> it might've felt like a lot of silence, but I, I'm certain it was probably less than five seconds of silence, um, both in the classroom and in this environment, that quiet time, that dead space can feel like an eternity. Um, so one of the tips that we can do very easily is to build in more wait time um, to have more responses from people, to allow people time to think about what the response to this question is. There's a lot of reasons why wait time is important and we often rush that because of the discomfort we feel with silence. Um, so I wanna encourage you to not be uncomfortable with silence, set your timers, um, tell your students, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to think independently before I prompt you for responses so that they understand that this is a part of the, this is part of the active learning is to have that quiet time to formulate your responses. Um, and this is really important as somebody, um, I think, you know, I think of scales and for example, one of the scales that I've um, encountered has a, an item on it that says something along the lines of, do you rehearse what you're going to say before you say it? Um, well, it turns out there are a lot of people who like to formulate their thoughts before they say them out loud. So this wait time allows for a, a broad variety of people to have not only the time to think about what they would say, but also to practice what they might say before they say it. So now I'm gonna invite you to do this a little bit differently. So that was one way we can, we can ask a group a question. And we often do this in our classes, it's an open-ended question, um, hoping for responses, waiting what seems like an eternity. Um, and sometimes I've seen, uh, you know, when I've gone into observe faculty teach that, that um, uncomfortableness can lead to them just answering their own question, right? So let's try it differently. What are possible reasons students may not speak up when we pose questions to a whole group? So let's harness this tool of Zoom. I would like for you to think quietly to yourself. So I'm going to moderate some thinking time. And what you're going to do is you're going to write your response in the chat, but you're not going to hit enter yet. You're simply going to compose your response in the chat window. And then I will cue you to hit enter when the time is up. So um, I'm going to give you a short time to think about this question. What are possible reasons students may not speak up when we pose questions to a whole group?
Okay, and if you've had time to think of something, if you could compose it, find yourself to the chat window. I know sometimes it can be difficult to navigate in Zoom. So um, figure out where your chat button is and you're gonna write it, but not hit enter. Okay, so I'm going to count down from three. And then when I finish, I will say go. And that's when you're going to hit enter. Go. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if the audio came through on your end. My son is a musician, so he made a soundtrack for me for this particular exercise. <laughs> OK, great. So let's take a look. Um, and in fact, I think because I'm in presenter mode, I can't actually scroll through. I'm going to try to find the, here we go. Here we go. Yep. Good. Okay. I can see now. Um, nice. Okay. So I'm seeing a variety of responses here. Um, they might be more interested in hearing other people's ideas rather than stating their own. They might be self-conscious, uh, judgment from peers, afraid of being wrong. Maybe they're shy. Um, very good. Fear of being judged. Not sure that they're understanding the question or the expected response. The response. That's right. Like I think our students often don't know what is considered right or what the instructor is looking for because oftentimes this is the way we have taught our students to behave in this format. And so even if you have a question that you don't necessarily feel has a right answer, they're going to be worried that it's not exactly the kind of response that you might be looking for. Language barriers, absolutely, especially among students for whom English is a second language. They may feel self-conscious about that or they might have a strong accent. Very good. So you're coming up with a lot of reasons why we might not hear from students when we pose an open-ended question like this. So what happened in that scenario is it's a really unstructured way to ask a question, right? And we see from your responses that there are a variety of reasons, valid reasons, that students don't feel comfortable participating when we ask a question in this way. So what we wanna do instead is to think about how can we build in more structure in the way that we facilitate so that students do feel more comfortable. And here's a prime example of that. You all had a chance to think and write and then respond and we scroll through some responses and hopefully you had a chance to scroll through the chat as well so you could see the responses of your peers um, and maybe even got some validation out of the fact that some of the students had brought up some of the same ideas you did, right? So there are lots of ways we can harness, especially technology to be thinking about um, being more inclusive in our practices. So what I wanted to um, really focus on is this idea of structure. Unstructured learning environments lead to unfairness, feelings of exclusion, and collisions of students' cultural background with the learning environment. Adding structure to learning environments can mitigate unfairness, promote feelings of inclusion, and promote student success. And when you think about that, that component structure, um, really, it's on us as instructors to design that structure. We have the ability to do that in our courses. And that's what I wanted to spend my time talking about is how we would do that both in course design and classroom environment. So in course design, this is when we state our objectives, when we think about our syllabus and the content of our syllabus, how many opportunities we have for practice, hopefully lots, um, the types of assessments, the types of projects that we give to our students. So this is all part of the way, the architecture of our courses, right? So we have to ask ourselves, who's being left behind by the choices we make in our course design? And this is a great time to be thinking about your material and who might be left behind or feel that their voice is excluded by the choices you've made in, for example, the readings you've selected. Um, could they pot potentially own some of that decision-making for you as well in the course to, pr to provide suggestions for readings, um, thinking about ways that there might be flexibility too in the way that the course is designed or at least some of the materials. And then the other aspect of it is the classroom environment. And I'm going to use classroom environment loosely because I think in the coming year, we're going to be thinking about that in a very broad sense, but in the ways in which we interact with students and the ways that they interact with each other. Every time we facilitate anything, we have to be thinking about who's not being heard as a result of the way that I've designed my facilitation. So these are the core components that um, I've, I'd like to focus on when I speak about inclusive teaching because it's, a, it's integral to every course we teach, regardless of the subject matter that we have in our course. 
So that's where I wanted to start. And of course, I'm very excited to hear from my colleagues and, um, and invite questions when we um, conclude this initial portion around these topics. But thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Sathy. We are, we've already got a ton to think about. And I'm, I was like busy scrolling down all of my questions, which I hope I get to ask, but I'm sure others will have many. So um, next, I would love to introduce Dr. Sinead Young. Dr. Young is the Danforth Endowed Professor in the Department of Psychology at Morehouse College. Dr. Young focuses on taking a participatory action, research, and evaluation approach to health equity issues. And her areas of specialty include program evaluation, quantitative and qualitative methodologies, pedagogy, and curriculum development. So I'm really excited to hear from Dr. Young today. Please take it away. Thank you. Just gonna take a moment to share my screen. Bear with me while I get it set up. Okay. So greetings, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and so pleased that I was invited to discuss this topic. Um, and I wanted to thank Dr. Sathi. I think that was a, a beautiful setup and very interactive and typically how I like to run my classroom. So I, I'm going to do something um, a little bit more didactic, uh, but hopefully as informative. Um, I am really excited to discuss this, particularly during this time that we're facing really two pandemics um, in the country and really globally speaking. Um, I have had the privilege of being at Morehouse College for the past 13 years um, as a professor of psychology, but I also work in the Public Health Science Institute. And so for those who are unfamiliar, Morehouse is a historically black college and um, just a little bit of background about historically black colleges. They were established prior to 1964, um, and that's when they actually received federal designation. Uh, most of these institutions, and there's currently about 100 left in the US, there are many more, but most of these institutions were founded prior to uh, or during Reconstruction, and the goal was to educate the formerly enslaved. Dr. Young, can I interrupt you for one second? Of course, yes. Um, would you mind projecting your full screen because I think people are having a hard time seeing it. Ah, let's see. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so maybe just yeah, go to the full screen, bottom right. Okay, how's that? No. Still? No, still same. no if, if you go back to this, the, the view you had a second ago. Uh-huh. And, and I think, uh, no, just go back to where you just were. See, I think I'm on two screens, which is there, yeah. There you go. So, so if you just go to the bottom right, where you can actually show the full screen, Are you right there. Yeah. Ah, here. Okay. Bottom right. No, just to the right of it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> Let's try that. Okay. How is that looking? I think the problem may be that you're in presenter mode, or it, it's in. Um, yep. Go here. Go here. PowerPoint's and presentation mode. Display. Hit swap display in the top left. It has a circle around it. So I'm getting off of my second screen, hoping that will help. Sorry to interrupt your flow. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. So let's try this. How's that looking? Oh, yes. Excellent. Okay. My apologies. I was on two screens and so it did something odd. That's great. Thank as, you. Thank you. Uh, so um, as I was mentioning, most HBCUs, as we call them, were uh, founded during Reconstruction. And so um, many were funded by philanthropists, typically from the North. Uh, Freedmen's Bureau provided some funding for HBCUs. And many are also affiliated with, or were affiliated with churches. And so in their missions, many have a service component and also, which is a little bit more subtle for some institutions, a social justice component as well. So I think it's really timely that we discuss this. Unfortunately, I, I will say that um, oftentimes HBCUs are not at the table when we discuss diversity and inclusion issues. And I think that's for a number of reasons, including that most people see these institutions as quite homogenous. Um, and I will say that, you know, 
there are many HBCUs that are they're historical colleges, not always predominantly black colleges. So there are some that have a diverse uh, student body and are no longer predominantly black. Um, and there are some that um, like my school, Morehouse College, it is the only all male historically black college um, in the US and, and probably globally. So uh, once again, I, like I said, I'm really excited and think this is a timely discussion. Uh, public health wise, um, most current public health professionals who are black will have uh, most likely trained at a historically black college for undergraduate careers or uh, pass through our Project Imhotep for summer programs. Morehouse is located in Atlanta, Georgia, um, home of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so we do have a cooperative agreement with the CDC. So we, this is the first year that we actually um, are not having a summer program because of the pandemic. But um, many, many individuals have either trained um, at a HBCU or been mentored by someone who has trained at an HBCU. So oftentimes I teach uh, various psychology courses, but I also teach uh, intro to public health. And um, sometimes I teach an epidemiology course as well. And what, I, what I'm dealing with my students, and again, most of my students are predominantly black, but you know, we have students um, of various racial and ethnic backgrounds. I also teach in the summer program, which is students from all over. And so I often ask them, what does diversity look like to you? And I ask this question because we know that how you view the world is gonna impact your work. And also how you view yourself. So I ask them, what does diversity look like? And the answer will vary depending on where they're from. So for me, having grown up in California, diversity might look very different than someone who grew up in the South where it becomes more binary and they focus more on racial issues. Next question I tend to ask my students are, what are your multiple identities? And this tends to stump them because oftentimes uh, when we ask people about their identity, they tell you uh, demographic characteristics. So I am a black woman. I grew up in the South, I grew up in the West. And so I, I start to draw circles on a board and ask them about all of these different identities that they might have. And then, um, particularly for my students of color, I, I ask them about diversity and what it looks like if it is not anchored in whiteness. So often they'll describe themselves and it's really in reaction to whiteness, particularly in this country. And this stumps them. <laughs> this stumps them quite a bit because I think for a moment they have to think about this because again, we are such a color, color conscious society um, that they take a moment, you know, and, and um, as we saw in the last presentation, five seconds, you know, you need a couple of seconds to, to get your mind wrapped around it. So this is a graphic that I have seen quite a bit uh, going around on Facebook and, and other social media sites, um, particularly in response to the uprisings. And, and it is uh, basically the notion of listen to people of color, listen to black people. But you know, I, I push back a little bit because I ask, um, or at least this graphic alludes to a point where um, black people or people of color uh, should be the ones who have the onus placed on them to lead. And so I, I like to complicate this idea a little bit and, and ask, well, what does true collaboration look like when we're, we're tackling these issues? Um, why, why am I looked at as having an expertise? I have a lived experience and so do you. And so I also think about being at a historically black college, what would this graphic look like if there were two people of color in this picture, and we don't know what race or ethnic group these individuals belong to, um, but you know, the idea is that it's the person of color who's going to lead the person who seems to be white. So you know, again, I, I like to to scrutinize that a little bit. So, at an HBCU. Um, there's some research, a little bit of research on diversity, and we have some of the same issues that you have at historically white colleges and universities. 
And a colleague wrote about this and, and talked about, because we are predominantly Black doesn't mean that we are sensitive to diversity issues, which is uh, absolutely true. So Morehouse College has just passed their gender identity policy. Um, and we are really working hard to make sure that we are, are doing right by our students who are coming in and educating ourselves and our students and our staff. And so there's a whole lot of diversity that exists within the college. So um, we could talk about socioeconomic status and perceived class, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, political, religious ideology, disability, ethnicity, race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when dealing with a predominantly black population, I like to talk to the students about the diversity that exists. There's a whole black diaspora out there. And so I think some students come in and it might be their first time being in an environment where everyone or most, the majority seem to be of African descent and they might make assumptions about their classmates. And this actually leads to some lively discussions um, because again, we can't assume that everyone just because they're of African descent uh, has the same experience. And I think that's the diversity that exists um, within most HBCUs. I mentioned earlier, most HBCUs have a service and social justice mission or orientation. Uh, what we try to do is train our students, and, and I want to remind folks that we are the school of Martin Luther King Jr. And so there's a high bar for students um, to step up to, but we, we try to teach our students to be in service too, rather than having a savior complex, that they're going to go in and save the world. Um, as I mentioned, HBCUs do have a long tradition of training public health professionals and um, Morehouse is part of a consortium of schools, including Spelman College, who you'll hear from my colleague um, in a little bit, uh, Clark Atlanta University, which used to be Clark College and Atlanta University, and Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, Clark Atlanta University, one of, or Atlanta University at the time, um, one of the preeminent faculty members was W.E.B. Du Bois, who did his Atlanta University studies while he was on faculty there uh, for his first 13 years there. And as we know, those studies have been seminal. Um, we've recently seen a book of his infographics published. Um, and so it's so interesting that he talked about the race color line issue being a problem of the 20th century. And again, those words still ring true. Uh, so again, I think that many of our students in the Atlanta University Center um, at HBCUs at, at most colleges are starting to understand or have a history of understanding the interconnected forces that produce the social conditions that lead to health inequities. And so I think about COVID and I think about all of those public health professionals that were asking for the race data when the epidemic first hit. and. Um, at that time, we thought that it was affecting everyone, but for most of us who have been studying these issues for a long time, we knew that the same health inequities that we saw in other diseases, other health conditions, would most likely be the same in COVID, and, and unfortunately, that is true. Um, the other thing to mention uh, before I wrap up about HBCUs is that there is a socio-historical connection with liberation theologies and pedagogies. As I mentioned, most of these institutions were founded around reconstruction and most have a connection with the church or had a strong connection with the church. If you speak with a Morehouse College alum um, of a certain age, they'll talk about having to go to chapel on a weekly and some on a daily basis. Um, and so if you look to liberation theologies uh, in this notion of I am because we are, that also plays out in pedagogy. Um, du Bois in his uh, autobiography talks about um, just the joy that he felt in teaching students and how there was a, he felt a charge to make sure that the work that he did, although it was scientifically based, he was really a forerunner in being a, um, um, a scholar and also an activist as well. So what I try to do in my courses, um, which I'm sure is not different than what most people try to do, but again, my context is slightly different, 
is implement the high impact practices that we know are effective with students. Um, I try to do a lot of service learning. Um, some of my work is in the prisons. And so I think that's important for students who are willing to see um, and experience what it is to do on the ground research in places that may, some may have had um, no prior knowledge of. Um, with some of our curriculum, we do, we have difficult courses and that could be across the board in psychology, biology, public health. And typically these are known as our gatekeeper courses or our weed out courses. Um, I take a slightly different stance and I, and I like most uh, professors, we try to use a coaching model and support systems where we really want the students to do well and ask them to rise to the occasion. Uh, we're not trying to thin out our majors, we're trying to make sure that they can rise to the challenge. Other best practices include peer learning, small group discussions and debates. Our students love debates. Um, Interactive lecture strategies, including call and response. We have the luxury at Morehouse of being a small liberal arts college of a uh, 2100 student population. So our classes on average are 12 to one, 12 students to one professor, which again, you can be extremely interactive and, and it's slightly more difficult when you have larger classes. Um, I also use varied assessment strategies. We know from the research that not everyone is a test taker. And so we spread out our points on the syllabus to make sure that individuals of varying abilities have an opportunity to do well in the course. Um, and again, I think it's extremely important to create safe spaces, asking people what their pronouns are, how do they wanna be addressed? How do we pronounce their names correctly? Um, I, I think all of these are extremely important. And, and we know that students um, we are one of the main points of contact with students at colleges and universities. So I've had students um, share very personal pieces of information which have helped me uh, figure out, well, when they're not in class, um, I know that there may be something else going on in their personal life. And this term is very popular lately, um, although it's been around for quite some time with decolonizing methodologies and decolonizing the classroom experience. A lot of work by Freire speaks to this. Um, what that looks like in practice for me is students as knowledge generators. Uh, we know that students love to tell stories about their lives, which is fine. And, and um, I tell them, you know, that's great. That is one lived experience. Um, but I, I also ask the students to be critical knowledge interrogators. So don't just take what they're hearing, interrogate it, question it. Just because someone has a degree, a PhD or other degree does not make them the expert per se. You may have something else to bring to the table. And also positioning uh, the students' lived experiences as a valid data point, but it's one data point. And lastly, I know I'm, I, I'm going a little bit over. I apologize about that. Um, as someone in public health and who teaches research methods and statistics, I find that my students are extremely interested in data that is relevant to them. And so I can't stress enough how um, I know that in public health, we, we tend to go towards our go-to data sets. Uh, but what I try to stress to students is there's lots of different forms of data out there. Um, archival data, I think, is, is woefully underutilized. Um, in, in the world of public health and, and psychology. Um, there's some uh, organizations that I've been using most recently in my classrooms. Um, I've listed a couple of them here. Um, and then I also encourage students to make up their own data sets. So collect data from varying sources and develop a new data set. But ultimately, um, you know, it, the experience of teaching at uh, HBCU, I think, probably mirrors the experience of individuals at other institutions with some nuances there. Um, and my goal is that HBCUs will not be seen just as an environment for people to come and recruit, but really collaborate with us and think about, well, how do students learn best in these different environments? So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you so much. That was really excellent. Um, and again, I have so many questions. Um, so our next panelist today is Dr. India Ornelas. Dr. Ornelas is Associate Professor in the Department of Health Services at the University of Washington, also known as UW. 
She teaches in the MPH program at UW and is the director of the MPH core curriculum. Her research focuses on understanding how social and cultural factors influence the health of Latino and American Indian communities. And she collaborates with communities to develop and test culturally relevant interventions in the areas of mental health, substance use, and cancer prevention. So welcome, Dr. Ornelas. Our you program. Lose, Dr. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, while we get the slides pulled up, I just was saying that um, I'm also a product of one of those great summer programs. Uh, attended one at Morehouse School of Medicine um, in between when I was getting, when I finished my undergraduate degree and then uh, before I moved into my master's in public health. So um, I am going to tell you a little bit about how we are trying to integrate equity into the planning of a new common core curriculum that we're doing um, for the MPH program at the University of Washington. So this is not a, a curriculum that's actually been implemented. I've lost audio here. I'm not sure if that's the same for others. Yeah, I don't hear the for anymore. India, we can't hear you. Um, there you go. You're back. Okay. It says unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Oh. It looks like we have your slide up. So okay. I'm well, sure. I can just talk without my video. I'm not. I'm not seeing my slide. But there now I am. <laughs> so you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, and it's okay. I can talk without video. So our new MPH core curriculum was. Um, we decided to update it about two years ago, and the idea was to. Um, better integrate both research and practice skills to help students better prepare for the changing public health landscape. Um, this new core curriculum teaches and assesses all of the foundational competencies that CIF requires. CIF is our accrediting body for all masters in public health programs. And so um, what we did is we um, designed six brand new courses. They're all team taught and they're all team taught by people in two different departments. So um, for example, I'm teaching one of the courses and I'm teaching it with somebody um, in global health, a different department than me. And that allows us to include different disciplinary backgrounds, but it also allows us to have greater representation in the faculty overall. So um, we think that's a real strength of the program and, and we'll bring different perspectives into the classroom. All our faculty and TAs have been trained on active I've lost your audio again, I'm sorry. Um, and equity is one of them. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how, um, how we're doing that. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. The, fly, the slides look a little blurry to me. I'm not sure if they look like that to others, but. Um, Great. So uh, this just gives an overview of what the Common Core courses are. We have, we're on a quarter system at UW. So we have um, two that are taught in autumn, two that are taught in winter, and two that are taught in spring. So we start with the foundations of public health and we actually in that class um, very early on acknowledge the role of public health and healthcare in actually perpetuating racism so that we can really um, establish up front the need for our students to have training and how to become anti-racist public health professionals. We have two methods courses, one that focuses on kind of foundational skills in epi and biostat. And then the second one is a mixed methods course where they're learning qualitative data as well, or how to analyze qualitative data and use mixed methods approaches. 
The determinants of health class covers both physical and social determinants of health. And so um, this integrates things that might have typically been in uh, an environmental health class that would have stand, stand alone. But in this way, we're able to um, talk about things like environmental justice from both uh, you know, a social justice perspective and an environmental um, perspective. This is another course where we're talking explicitly about the role of structural racism in shaping health patterns. And then in the spring quarter, we have um, two courses, one on implementing public health interventions. That's the one that I co-teach and one on public health practice. And um, again, we have health equity content in both of those courses as we're thinking about how to work with diverse communities to develop, implement and test interventions. And in public health practice, a lot of the focus is how we work in partnership with communities um, and how the role of community engagement and the role of, of public health um, professionals in terms of their leadership um, in knowing, you know, how to, again, work in diverse communities and with diverse teams. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of how we're thinking about integrating equity into the core. So in terms of the curriculum planning, what we've been doing um, so far is really trying to scaffold the con the content throughout the year because the instructor team all works together. We're actually able to be very thoughtful about what content shows up where um, over the year. Um, and as I mentioned, it sort of builds over the year. That's, the, that's also the case for assignments that we really try to scaffold the assignments so that they can do richer, more complicated assignments as they move through the year. We have a syllabi statement that really names our intention to create a welcoming climate um, and give students a place to go if they have um, concerns. So one of the things that we've actually been working um, pretty hard on becoming a more anti-racist institution um, for the last five years, and, and we adopted this new syllabi statement um, a few years ago. And one of the things that we recognized early on that was that students don't have um, a, didn't have a place to go if they had concerns about what was happening in the classroom. And so that's something we've been trying to be very intentional about. And then we're also thinking again about representation and readings and assignments and examples, data sets, um, as Sinead mentioned, case studies and speakers. And when you have an integrated core, you can think about that not necessarily just in your own class, but again, over the whole year. So we are you know, creating matrices so that we can see, well, which case studies are we using and can we build on those? Are we seeing representation from multiple populations so that different types of students feel represented across the whole year and that they're not seeing the same, maybe same negative example of their health community being stigmatized or portrayed in, in a negative way over and over again, which we know is also really harmful for students of color. And then we're trying to build in lots of opportunities for co-learning and peer learning, really addressing um, those issues of power that other speakers have brought up by having a lot of small group um, and paired activities in, in the classroom. Next. And so um, lastly, I just wanted to give you some examples about how we're thinking about equity in terms of the actual uh, implementation. Um, and again, you know, this will be tricky as we think we may need to go um, online this fall, um, but we're trying to still maintain our commitment um, to doing some of these activities and this active learning pedagogy. Um, so we, the cohort's gonna be quite big. It will be probably around 140 students that move through these courses together. And so we're trying to also create opportunities for the students to connect and get to know one another. And so we're creating learning communities that will that the students will stay in that will be smaller groups, probably around 30 students that they um, can interact with in the classroom, um, they'll be the basis for group assignments, TA assignments, that kind of thing. But they'll also be encouraged to meet and connect outside the classroom, um, and we'll have we'll help them with those kinds of social events. They'll be meeting their learning community at orientation, and we know that getting to know um, other students um, on a deeper level can also really contribute to um, the confidence that they feel in the classroom. We're trying to do ongoing monitoring of the, the core through mid-course evaluations and ongoing instructor meetings. So we'll all continue to meet. So we'll be able to sort of learn and iterate what's um, as we go along. And I think this will be really helpful in terms of supporting students too, that we can pass on knowledge from quarter to quarter to the new instructors. 
we have established very consistent um, ways of, or trying to establish just consistent ways of giving feedback to students. We're going to have a consistent grading distribution, um, again, to try to get at those issues of fairness um, and having consistent support for students um, that need it and being able to refer students to support and tutoring and mentorship um, as needed. And then we also are doing, uh, you know, course and program evaluations. And we have um, for a, a couple of years now been using specific course evaluation questions that actually focus on climate to make sure that we are providing a, a welcoming climate. And we'll be also adding questions about the content to make sure um, students feel like they are represented in the content as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, in the Q&A and thank you. Sorry, I didn't get Thank to you. see me, but I'm back. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. We have a lot to talk about. I think we're going to be here till midnight. Just everybody buckle up. I'm canceling class. Can't do that. I wish I could. I mean, I don't really wish I could. Anyway, um, I would love to introduce our last but certainly not least speaker. Dr. Rosalind Gregory Bass is a health scientist with a passion for developing innovative curricula in a diverse healthcare workforce. She currently serves as chair and associate professor of environmental and health sciences program at Spelman College and is the director of the health careers program. In this capacity, she supports the instruction and career development of young women interested in health professions. She's a proud alumna of Spelman College, graduating with a BS in biology, before matriculating at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, where she gained both her master's degree and medical doctorate. Her residency training in the area of physical medicine and rehabilitation and postdoctoral research training in women's health helped her to have both a basic science and applied translational component to her scholarly work. This was key to her design of curricula in the health sciences and mentoring of many students over the past 20 years who now are represented in a, diverse, uh, in a diversity of fields ranging from medicine to public health. So please, Dr. Gregory Bass, take it away. Good evening, everyone. It truly is a pleasure being able to be part of this um, dynamic panel who have shared so many enlightening things about their institutions, their curricula, um, pedagogy, as well as um, just ways in which we can um, just really shape the conversation for our students around public health and um, specifically areas of inclusivity in our day-to-day -day, um, curricula that we share with them. So um, today I just wanted to take some time to um, cover what we are attempting to do at Spelman College and um, the way in which for many years um, we have been able to work with a very diverse group of students um, and similar to what uh, Dr. Young mentioned, uh, sometimes, especially when working at a historically black college, um, there may be an assumption that there is a very similar thought, but for those of us who engage with the young women on a daily basis, we find that there is um, a number of different experiences um, and based on the um, exposure of the students, that just enriches the day-to-day -day conversation that we have, especially in our attempt to understand theory, understand um, uh, key issues that impact um, how we try to impact or want to actually improve health outcomes in a number of different communities. So let me share my screen with you. I just have a couple of slides. So um, for our department, one of the things that we wanted to do and really institutionally is what are our governing bodies and um, how can we not reinvent the wheel per se, but to really align with what are some of the things that are happening nationally, what is the overall national agenda and making sure that um, for our students who are young in their various disciplines, as well as preparing to be professionals in the future, to help them to understand 
um, how all of these different governing bodies work closely together and to be able to shape the way in which they too may want to have an impact on society. And particularly, um, we know that APHA has highlighted that um, public health promotes and protects the health of people and communities where they live, learn, work, and play. And that is really it's op the operational definition and one in which we try to consistently um, share with our students so that um, in all that we do, we know that we will come back to that um, operational definition. The vision of the organization is to create the healthiest nation um, in one generation. And as it relates to the mission is to improve the health of the public and achieve equity in health status. So um, for our institution, that vision and mission really aligns with our institutional mission. And um, many of the alum, you will hear them say that um, since 1881, um, Spelman was founded with social justice in mind and also with healthcare in mind. Um, for those not familiar with Spelman College, it is a small liberal arts institution of approximately 2,000 students representing 43 states. Um, and you will see on the slide, um, the top five states are Georgia, New York, Maryland, Cal California, and Florida. Oftentimes individuals think that, think that it, perhaps it is just state students who attend, but they're really coming from all over and even 13 foreign countries. Um, when we think about the institution overall, it actually is the first um, college on record to train former slaves to become nurses. Um, it wasn't the first to offer the actual bachelor's degree um, that was Tuskegee. However, it was definitely founded with that in mind, making sure that um, the institution would always be on the forefront of um, participating in activities as well as enhancing the overall diagnosis, um, prevention and treatment um, of a number of different conditions that impact individuals and particularly underrepresented groups. So when we had an opportunity to think broadly about health and healthcare, we wanted to find out what was going to be the best way to do that. And there were a number of things happening um, around 2013, 2014, um, as it relates to the medical college admissions test, they were completely revamping it and wanting to include um, more areas such as a psychosocial section to bring in the overall understanding or to assess the understanding of students' knowledge of health disparities, social determinants of health. And um, what we found is that this conversation was happening nationally in a number of other areas as well, including um, at the AACNU or Association of American Colleges and Universities where I was engaging as a professor at that time in the biology department about how do we um, remove the silos that exist around campus. And even though we're still a small campus, um, sometimes those silos exist among the various disciplines and how can we begin to think interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarily? And so um, for our institution, um, some of the faculty were able to participate in a program called Preparing Critical Faculty for the Future. And um, I happen to be part of that, working with Alma Clayton Pedersen, Orlando Taylor, um, Patricia Lowry, a number of individuals in the field who really worked with uh, tenure track faculty at the time to think more broadly and to come up with proposals and ideas that they felt would be of um, good use for their institution and helping them accomplish their overall um, goals and student learning outcomes. And out of that conversation and support, um, we actually had a summit focused in on health disparities. 
And there was a call sent out to faculty and we had probably about 10 faculty that responded from all of the different disciplines, whether it was in the world languages where we had faculty that were interested in creating medical Spanish courses or our history department focused on the history of science and um, health outcomes um, in the United States, all the way to our economists who focused on health econ and just really wanting to come up with various courses or majors that allowed us to bring in many different disciplines to address complex problems happening nationally. And so um, the health science major is one that we considered and felt that it would not only have its foundation in public health, as you see on the slide, just really wanting to make sure that that served as the core to whatever else we were going to do in terms of scaffolding of courses and experiences for students. And so in 2015, we were able to um, have the curriculum committee review all of these different um, considerations for being able to develop a new major at Spelman College um, entitled health science. And what you see around the slide is just all of the different components that we felt would um, help us to have uh, the student learning outcomes met for those um, students and budding health scientists, uh, public health specialists that wanted to um, have an impact on health outcomes in the future. And so given the fact that it is in our STEM division, it did have a core focus in the natural sciences with all students having to have a year of biology, a year of chemistry, um, as well as a year of organic chemistry. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that their quantitative um, skills, um, their statistical analysis, understanding of epidemiology, um, making sure they were sound in their theoretical framework of race and gender, um, again, bringing in the psych psychosocial component, um, and then even starting to think about data science in a new and different way, especially as it related to health informatics. Um, and then um, on the other side of the slide, you find that human pathophysiology and understanding of disease, no matter what they were going into, we felt was important, along with infectious disease. Um, there is a clear intention to bridge our major with the health careers program um, in order to make sure that students knew not only were we interested in their theoretical understanding and foundational knowledge, but wanted them to be able to see how do they bridge this into their future career. And so um, there are certain components or aspects of the major that are required for students so that they would be able to be engaged um, and participate in practicum related experiences. And new to the um, major outside of our international studies major was a global and cultural engagement component where there's an expectation that every major will have a study abroad experience. We're very for fortunate at Spelman that there has been funding to really allow for over 70% of our students to document that they have had at least one type of study abroad experience. Um, and we even find there are some students who have had five or six in different ways, whether it was prior to coming to our institution or even while there, we provided a diversity of ways in which they can have that experience. And specific to our department, we have um, allowed for students to have um, focused experiences uh, related to global health. Um, we take students to Cape Town, South Africa, or they have a choice of being able to go to Trinidad and Tobago um, with, of course, South Africa focused in on HIV. And in Trinidad, the focus is in, is in um, diabetes mellitus. And so um, before everyone graduates, they must participate in a scholarly um, research project. And, um, and it is a combination of everything listed here along with their individual experiences. And I think that um, at Spelman, similar to perhaps other institutions, we make sure that students have the ability to think about their experiences um, as individuals, um, experiences that they've had in their communities, 
things that their families have experienced in order to bring all of that to the classroom and for us to be able to engage about how their experience has led to the information that's being shared and motivates them to be impactful beyond the classroom. So um, I, I won't go into detail about um, each of these things, but I just at least wanted to share with you that there's a competency-based curricular initiative with um, the major and the department overall. Um, where we look at the first year as being foundational, the second year is where students are really gaining an understanding of core um, operational definitions and then um, other introductions to the discipline. And then at that third year, we're looking for them to really apply the information. And then the fourth year is about the self-actualization of them as a future um, health scientist, public health specialist, um, and the beginning of their scholarly contributions to the field. So it's not just enough to hold that information personally, but to then feel as though they are part of the um, academy and the larger uh, disciplinary uh, group that they are interested in joining. Um, and to be able to evolve from being a student to also being a contributor of the knowledge as well. So um, with that being said, um, we have been able to um, have a number of ways in which we uh, had students um, think about their experiences in their various classes and to develop modules that are also very interactive. Um, so when we think about our intro to health science class, we take students through um, the process of developing a logic model for a health promotion activity that they would like to design to, um, to think about Healthy People 2020 um, and that initiative and for them to select a particular uh, thing that they would like to address. And they do this all in the context of developing a health fair for the Spelman College community. And so um, we generally in the fall semester have all of the students um, once again present um, their actual uh, project and then to gather data on whether they feel that the um, health literacy uh, project in itself has impacted the way students understand a given pathophysiologic um, condition that disproportionately impacts um, African-American women. We also um, look at media as well. And so I don't know if individuals are familiar with the movie Puncture, but it is a great movie to use as a model of understanding the complexities of not only how healthcare is delivered, but also what are some of the political and corporate structures that impact the ability of various healthcare agencies um, and having the best products to use. And in this case, it's the story of having retractable needles that prevent um, there from being um, unintended sticks that could unfortunately lead to the transmission of HIV or other um, bloodborne pathogens. And so you will find that in this movie, we have a chance, or after students watch this movie, we have a chance to talk about all of those things and then to also look at, um, for the lawyer in the case who's trying to represent um, one of the clients, that lawyer is suffering with a substance use because of the pressures associated with being in a various profession. And so we even look at that as a, um, we have a conversation about substance use and handling stressors and various types of professions. And so um, it again is a way for students to engage and use media as a way to do that. Um, and then here our students participate um, in research related activities. Um, we have our Spelman College Research Day, but also support our students in going to the annual biomedical research conference for minority students. And um, as Dr. Young mentioned our relationship with the Atlanta University Center Public Health Science Institute, but I also wanted to say that we've been intentional about setting up articulation agreements with 23 um, other uh, institutions, Boston University being one of them, um, and it allows our students to, for some of those programs, travel 
to institutions to conduct research or to be able to work with community health related organizations. Similar here, these women um, and the founder, um, Lisa Kerr uh, in Madison, Wisconsin has started the foundation for black women's wellness. And so our students were on the ground with her being able to establish this nonprofit organization um, so that they too can learn should they wanna impact healthcare in that way, they have the ability to do so. So I will stop here, but just wanted to share with you how we've been able to take an idea about um, a number of different things we wanted to envelop in a health science major with a foundation in public health, and then turn that into just um, a robust experience for our undergraduate students who now have been equipped with um, skills as well as knowledge to go into a diversity of careers. So with that being said, thank you. That is so great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregory Bass. And thank you to all of our presenters today. This is just a cornucopia of knowledge and great ideas. And I'm getting a hand cramp from all the, all the writing I'm doing. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions now. And I know that we have a number of them. One of them already got answered uh, in writing, so that's uh, very efficient of us. Um, a, a couple of people right off the bat wanted to, um, didn't catch the movie that you mentioned, Dr. Bass. So if you wanted to let us know what that is again. Um, yes, that movie is called Puncture. P-U-N-C-T-U-R-E. And, um, and another great movie, believe it or not, is um, Pursuit of Happiness with Will okay. Smith. And that's when we have a chance to talk about homelessness, hygiene. We are able to just talk about a number of, um, of different uh, public health uh, issues, social determinants of health, and then just also parenting structure and, and how uh, it will all, you know, it varies, but still um, plays a role when we engage with various citizens on a day-to-day -day basis to find out what's most important for them when they think about their wellness. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so everybody go and watch Puncture tonight. We could have a viewing party. Hit me up. Um, one question comes from Kim Ramsey White and asks, is there a repository of syllabi or assignments that any of the presenters draw from or contribute to? Um, and uh, has anyone had a chance to read or utilize the recently released book, Teaching Racism, The Toolbox for Public Health? Faculty, I will say I've already started drawing on that book, but I'd love to hear from you all about what are your go-to um, resources. I don't know of any repositories, but I have been using that book too. That book came out um, right as I was getting ready to teach a social determinants of health class um, last fall, and I was really excited. And I just kept assigning more and more and more. <laughs> But I, I'm pretty sure that our determinants of health class will draw on readings from that book as well. Um, and we have had all our student, all our faculty, our core faculty read the teaching public health book. Um, so that's been a great help. And, um, you know, we had a lot of faculty input on the core course um, curriculums, including um, we had committees basically that created the, the early drafts of syllabi for each of those core courses. And so we got a lot of input from people from different disciplines on potential readings. And now the people that are actually teaching the courses are refining those lists and kind of figuring out what they wanna teach themselves. But I don't know of any repositories of other syllabi out there. Um, you know, we've had requests for our, um, some of our classes, syllabi from some of our classes. And I just wanna say that I think it's really important for institutions to really hire um, faculty with this expertise themselves and not, not draw on other people's work and labor all the time and repositories and that you really need to um, have that, that one of the, the kind of ways that we wanted to actually drive more faculty diversity in our school was by creating the anti-racism competency that we did. And we knew that if we had the, the competency as a requirement for all students, we would have to have faculty that could teach to that competency. And so that was our way of really ensuring that we could um, you know, have faculty that had that depth of expertise. I will add that because public health is so interdisciplinary, I tend to, and because I have a, a psychology background, I tend to use resources from the American Psychological Association, uh, Division Two, which is the Society for Teaching. 
Uh, they have some great syllabi that I often will modify uh, for public health courses. Okay, any other go-to textbooks that we should know about besides the, the racism one is quite thick. So we all probably need a year or two to get through that. I'm going to add one more to the list. Um, it's a book by Cindy Carnahan teaching about race and racism in the college classroom. Um, and it's subtitled Notes from a White Professor. So um, maybe worth a read for some of the audience members. Excellent. Thank you for that. OK, um, another question. Wow, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, so um, uh, one, one viewer asks, I've realized that the MPH curriculum is very diverse. How then do we ensure standardization and quality control in the delivery of the MPH program? And I would, I'm gonna take the liberty of focusing this question and ask us, how do we ensure that we're delivering in a, in a standard quality and up to snuff way, uh, specifically an anti-racist and anti-oppressive um, MPH curriculum? Um, maybe that question is for me. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, the competencies we were, we draw on the competencies as our way of checking, you know, what we're what we're teaching. And I think it was great that CIF adopted the new competency that focuses more on structural racism, um, and that's a way that we can build it into our courses and evaluate whether or not we're we're doing a good job teaching it. Um, you know, I think we have to monitor ourselves. Um, and I think that we, you know, a big part of anti-racism is accountability. And um, that means that we have to evaluate faculty to make sure that they're teaching these concepts, but also doing it in a way that is inclusive. Um, and then not only the faculty, but holding a leadership accountable to that too, and making sure that leadership um, is ensuring that that is all happening. Terrific. Anybody else want to comment on that? And we did have a prior question that got answered in text as a sidebar, but I would love to revive a part of it, which asks, how do we um, specifically, how do we bake that into our evaluation, our course evaluation processes? What sort of questions should we be asking? How do we integrate it into our, you know, annual faculty evaluations and, and such? Anybody can take that one on as you see fit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off here as uh, the assessment is one of the uh, hats that I wear on our campuses around assessment. Um, I often will tackle this one, even if it's not a question that's on the standard instrument, it's one that I, I ask my students to um, answer. So we have the opportunity to craft our own questions in that instrument. And so the one of inclusion is one that I always focus on both at the beginning and the end of the course. Um, it's important for me to know upfront what they perceive as inclusion in part of the class. And sometimes I say it's hard to come up with examples of what inclusion looks like, but maybe you could think, give me examples of what X exclusion looks like in a classroom environment. And that can help them articulate the feelings that they have when they're not excluded, when they're not included in a classroom environment. So it's really helpful information for me. And then at the end of the semester to circle back, because it's part of the transparency in the course to say, you know, every aspect of this course from the design to the facilitation was um, is focused on this element of inclusion. Can you tell me about what what worked for you? What would you like to see improved? Um, so even if it's not part of the standard assessment, I would encourage you to be asking your students to weigh in on this. And it doesn't have to be just twice. It can be multiple times in the semester. Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, I think this also speaks to um, what Freire refers to as co-intention setting. And that is really, I think it's really different how, than how most of us were trained. Um, at the beginning of a semester, we tend to have a very rigid syllabus um, and have these very standardized assessments um, in a syllabus. And so I think this is where a little bit of community-based participatory action research comes into play in pedagogy where if you're setting the intention with the student and if you're focused on those competencies, you know what it is that you want the students to learn. Now, how they're gonna learn that and how they're gonna demonstrate that is going to vary quite a bit. And I do feel that oftentimes 
we have to give some students some leeway. So for instance, and, and this is what I wrote in the chat, you may have some students who write a uh, proposal uh, for a final assignment or a final paper. And you may have other students who say that I wanna do a podcast or that I wanna do a photo voice project. And, you know, again, I think as a professor, you know, we, we wanna have a very standard way and wanna make sure that we're, we're treating everyone equally, but it's equity that we're trying to get to. And I think that it is a little bit scary, right? Because it, it's kind of forcing some of us out of our comfort zones. And it is also more time consuming. So I, I think that really focusing on the competencies really are key, but also thinking about the varied ways that students learn or demonstrate that they've learned. I was also going to add um, that conversations around race and being at a single gender institution, um, we find that there are also very often conversations about gender and that for our students coming in, many of them take a historical course called African Diaspora in the World. And, um, and I think for some, they, as they've stated to me that it is sometimes the first time where they are able to really um, start thinking about uh, race in a number of different ways, starting to understand culture um, from really just this organic awareness as they listen to their classmates based on their own individual experiences. As I stated, students are coming from many different states as well as around thir approximately 13 other countries. And so how a student from Ghana views race may be different from how a student in Savannah, Georgia is going to view race. And um, students know that it's a space where they can just really have these um, just epiphany moments about um, how they um, can think about themselves in many different ways, but then also take these same experiences through each year of their college experience. Um, and when we travel abroad, we find the same thing happens where there is this understanding of oneness but at the same time, understanding difference and having an appreciation for that. Um, and what I know in speaking with some of my other colleagues is that when students then transcend to go to the workforce or then go to their graduate and professional schools, sometimes the conversation does not continue or is robust or is comfortable to have, whereas they feel very comfortable still having those conversations without there being any defense or or, um, but just wanting to continue this flow of learning and understanding. And, and I think that in, from an assessment standpoint, um, we do more of the assessment when traveling abroad, I think, than um, in all of, let's say, our different classrooms that don't necessarily focus in on that construct. Um, you know, race, gender, and health is one course that we have, and like I mentioned, African diaspora in the world from a health perspective, but I just wanted to mention that, that that's what we find happens on our campus. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, wow, it's so hard to choose which question to ask next, but um, I think, um, and we're getting very short on time, but a question came in about the practice of cultural humility in the classroom, and I think this is becoming a much more common um, way of thinking about what we used to call cultural competency and a new way of thinking about it. So I don't know whether folks want to address that here. How do you operationalize that, see that? How does that show up in your classroom? Um, how, you know, how do you see it as distinct from what we used to do and, and think about, I'll, I'll just throw that out there for you. I think that the part of um, cultural humility that I um, try to focus on is that part of lifelong learning that we're never we're never done. Um, we're never done learning how learning more about other people and how to interact with them in ways that are respectful and um, 
and true, you know, true collaboration and true partnership. So I think um, it's an important concept, but I think it's actually really important that humility um, is really important for us to model as instructors too. And I think that that comes up, you know, in those moments of difficult conversations that we have to be aware of our own limitations, our own biases, and um, try to model that in the classroom as well. I just want to say I pause because I think, um, you know, and, and for those of us who are at undergraduate institutions, you know, while our student bodies tend to be a bit younger, developmentally, there's such an interesting phase that they're going through, um, becoming emerg emerging adults, right, so to speak. And so I think what's interesting is that they have lived experiences, even if they're coming in in their 17 or 18 years. Um, but because it is such a unique environment I, I, and they're coming in with these lived experiences, there's also some meaning making to these environments. And so for some of them, they're learning, well, what is this new culture that they're um, adapting to? So, you know, for some of our students, you know, maybe it is their first time being in a majority black environment. So you see some real shifts. And I think that part of it is giving them the leeway or the ability that you are going to evolve, and that's quite okay, and, and that is going to also inform how you um, deal with other people and how people view you as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a developmental thing, um, mm -hmm. I think, to, to consider for those of us at undergraduate institutions. Mm -hmm. And I, I add to thinking about, um, for example, group work. This is a common place where students start to wrestle with difference in a, in a more intimate way. Um, so the, the way that we mitigate some of the discomfort is to really provide some structure around how group work works, um, really giving them some guidelines. So for example, I might ask my students, and I do every time I do group work projects over the course of the semester to create group contracts, um, to really be thinking mindfully about how they plan to work together um, and, and to be planful about things that might arise and how they might um, navigate challenges in their work. But uh, aside from modeling, there's lots of things we could be doing in facilitating these conversations with our students when we task them with things where this is likely to come up. Well, I hate to cut us off, but the hour is upon us. It is six o'clock. And, um, but I really wanna thank you all, our panelists, Dr. Young, Dr. Gregory Bass, Dr. Staffy, Dr. Ornelas, thank you so much for being here with us. We have learned so much and this has been a marvelous conversation, which I really wish we could do all day. So thank you all so thank very you. much. Thank you. So uh, let thank me you. echo my thanks um, and um, just share one last slide if I can. So um, as we talked about, this is the, um, today is the second of three sessions. So we have a third uh, next week on Wednesday afternoon. And I see lots of you asking for the names of the movies, the books, the papers, the resources. We will gather those up and we have an office of lifelong learning just going to the point of we all need to keep learning. That is a repository that we can use to post all of these materials. You will also find, if you didn't come to our symposium two years ago, all of the talks that people gave there that then led to our book, Teaching Public Health. So if you're interested to see any of those, please do take a look. And next week, our session is going to include a keynote address by Raul Fernandez. He is the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. And he is a phenomenal speaker. I know you'll learn a lot from hearing him. We also have a panel of students, some of our students and recent alumni who are gonna share their experiences and ideas. And I know that's gonna be a powerful session as well. So I hope you can all join us again next week. And thank you so much. Thanks everyone.